Welcome to the part two of Pong, uh, this level one project meeting. Uh, one thing that we noticed from the, I guess the first level one meeting, whether it be through the feedback or just from our own observations is that uh, there wasn't enough of a, I guess, guidance in terms of the, like what to actually do when it comes to that. And I sent a message on the Discord for uh, people who want to next steps on that. And it's on the readme portion, not this, uh, of the Cal Poly CSAI, uh, you go to the GitHub and then uh, it's in Pong base and you see the readme and it has like all the, pretty much all the information that you need. And I'd like to open this up right now to any questions, uh, quick questions. Uh, does anyone have any questions on this who have seen this? If there's any confusion in regards to that. Do you guys know where to find this? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I'm just gonna just start this off since I didn't read, oh, did you have a question? All right, uh, so I'm gonna start this off uh, just going a little bit through this uh, since I didn't really get to go through it last time and uh, just to catch people up who haven't really done it. Uh, just gonna go through this real quick. So it starts off with some like some getting started, like setting up a Git repository on your local computer and then it gives some background knowledge on the code base because uh, C Sharp doesn't really have the standards that other languages has. So it might be a lot harder to read. So I have to put some of my own in. Uh, and then also uh, just some first steps to take, which is like, you're basically trying to explore the code base because when it comes to our level two projects that, we'll, that we're gonna be doing in the future, it's gonna be a lot of big projects which will have massive code bases and no one's gonna know what the hell's going on if you can't even read a code base that is developed in that. So I think this is a very good first exercise. Uh, and I believe Hack for Impact does something similar uh, where you essentially want to, like this explains a lot of it, you're creating documentation and just showing your understanding, general understanding of uh, something that's happening. If you feel like you don't really know what's going on, that's okay. Because most of the time, when it comes to industry, you actually don't completely have to know what's going on. You just have to know, like, let's say through the, maybe even the name of the function, what it's supposed to do. And obviously, there should always be lots of comments and everything in the code. So you use those as clues. And I have checked the GitHub, and I didn't really see any pull requests. Have any of you actually tried doing pull requests on the, uh, it says how to submit? says you just open up a pull request, uh, I believe like, and then like, let me just download it right here. So you open up pull request, so here. There's supposed <clears> to be a button where it says you're opening a pull request, but I'm on the CSA account. If so you're like on your own. Branch. Oh wait, I haven't stopped. I'm not signed in, but uh, <laughs> it says open a pull request and then you open a pull request. Is that how it works? Well, if you are on a different branch and you're trying to like merge into another branch and your branch is like ahead yeah. of a couple of commits, it should show up kind of in your GitHub, like a little green button at the top. That'll be like make the pull request. Yeah. And but, oh, yeah. Before you even start this, one of the things you want to do is go to it and fork the repository. I don't have the option here because it's not signed in, but it's explained in this readme. Uh, and then you're exploring and then making some brief write ups and opening a pull request and putting those write-ups in. And there are a few resources to, uh, for that. So is there any questions in regards to that? We can kind of move on to the next thing. If you guys have like trouble with this, you can always reach yeah. out to any of us too. So let's go on to the, where's the next okay. right. Yeah. So now let's talk about the fun stuff. Uh, in this part two of the Pong project, we're going to be adding reinforcement learning. And well, reinforcement learning, as I've already explained like twice before, is a really cool thing. And through Unity, it's a little bit different than what you would regularly do. What you're regularly doing in reinforcement learning, as we will see later, is you have some type of, uh, you might have some game or something. Uh, it could be any game and 
there is a library called Gymnasium, which is like you use it in Python and it just like wraps it over the game. So you could do math within the game. Uh, and that's what you usually do. You just do it with Python. Now it's a little bit different in the Unity. What makes it special is that you actually get to, like you're essentially the god of the game, you can do whatever you want in the game. That's what makes it so special that you have access to the source code of the game. What you're doing in like Python and using Gymnasium is you're essentially just like, uh, you can only control what's happening in the input and this stuff is all being exchanged in like binary and stuff. So you don't really have control over the rules and stuff of the game itself. And why this matters is like, uh, let's say you wanted to maybe, you, you're curious that what happens if like, I, let's say the walking speed of like uh, Mario is faster than it normally is. Like how will the Asian learn? Like you can't really do that unless you have like a hacked version of uh, Mario. And there are, those do exist, but like, if you were doing it for like a game that is not like the original Super Mario Bros, that's not like super retro that people cracked into so many times, which is often the case, you won't really have that kind of experience. And what about your own game? So that's why Unity ML Agents kind of provides a solution that you're able to use this reinforcement learning within the environment of Unity ML Agents. And the diagram I presented essentially shows like, okay, uh, your game is like, it's in a bag, right? It, it's in a bag, your game is in the bag. And from the bag, uh, outside of the bag, you have uh, like you have a Python little snake uh, that takes from the bag and does math on it and reinforcement learning. And then it's got to put it back into the bag so that you can use your AI in there. So the tool that we use for that is called Sentis. It actually came out like a week ago. Uh, they used something called Barracuda beforehand, but Essentially what happens is that you have, it's the way that you put it back into the bag. So after you've done this all like Python stuff, like you've taken out of the bag, like let's say the, the little Python snake in my analogy is uh, took like a character out of the game, like with its fangs and injected its like math venom into it. Uh, now that character is probably like bleeding and stuff, but now it knows some RL and stuff. Uh, but uh, let's just say, the bag is kind of racist and it doesn't want to let the uh, the agent back in because it has uh, the blood of RL in there. Uh, well, Sentis will allow it back in, but yeah, it will essentially allow it back in. So these two icons of TensorFlow and TyForge are so the two of the most popular machine learning or deep learning frameworks. Uh, and they're both primarily in Python. And what they do, you would just export the model that you have into a .onmx file, and Sentis would just take that, read it, put it into Unity, and you got your RL engine right there, uh, putting it back into the bag. And it's cool because you can actually, uh, from this, you can literally just straight up have like art generation games or something, because it's not just RL agents, it's like any type of uh, deployment that you want. It just happens to work very well for RL. So, now, speaking of RL, let's talk a little bit more about this. Uh-oh. Sorry, puns. Now, this is called a Markov decision process, but I like to say, I like to say that they just wanted to sound cool by giving it that name because it really isn't that much. All it really is is just the RL process that I've already described, but like, uh, they, they want to seem like a mathematician from a Greek century or whatever. Uh, so you just have an agent, an agent, and at some time, like let's say right now, uh, the situation, the occasion is like, okay, I'm a CSAI meeting. At this time, uh, I'm my action is talking and through this environment. And if you all say like, oh, you suck, uh, that'll update, that'll be feedback to me. And then I'll be like, hmm, maybe I shouldn't talk like this. And uh, I'll be less likely to take that action again within that situation. And that's really the, what reinforcement, that's what reinforcement learning is. But I think what most people confuse in this regard is that while that is what reinforcement learning is, I don't think that's like the key point to the story it tells. Because reinforcement learning 
is rather is not the cause, but more the symptom, in my opinion. Now, to illustrate this, it's like you've got to contextualize this when looking through like other types of artificial intelligence or machine learning, which is like supervised learning. Something goes in, something comes out. Very simple. And it's just one task. It straight up gives you an answer. Reinforcement learning, on the other hand, you're an agent and you're in an environment. Other types of AI, you're not in an environment. Like other types of AI, it's just like, like A or X to Y, X to Y. This, you're actually in an environment. And what you want to do is you want to take actions within this environment. You're not giving the answer, but maybe the next step towards your, uh, your overall goal. And that is fundamentally different because many applications uh, will actually focus in that regard. You might not always have something that is uh, the answer itself. Sometimes what you're trying to do is like, you know, a robot learning to walk. That is one of the most popular applications of reinforcement learning. That like just from the joints itself, and you're gonna see, an, you're gonna do an example of this too, uh, where just from the joints itself, moving the joints, that's what it has control over. So it's not, you can't just like, from only being able to move your joints, like straight up do all these acrobatics. You have to do it just as to, if you're gonna do acrobatics, it starts from the joints. And that, those are the things, things that you can control. Supervised learning on the other hand, it's like, it's like uh, this God where you put something in and then it just like makes it into reality or something. This is a lot more constrained because you're actually doing, doing something. The focus of RL, RL, more like do L. Like this is the main point of RL, that you're doing something towards a goal. Not the answer, but the step that you're taking. And that is the thing that I most often see people mess up, including PhD students, by the way. So uh, now to give a kind of demo on this, I'm gonna open up uh, this. And Jason, yeah. remember that link you threw up? Your all dog, this is it. Uh, I'm gonna kind of delve into this a little bit deeper, but what we're gonna do is uh, gonna use like shift enter to run these cells. Yeah, run it anyway. Uh, wanna do is probably on the notebook settings, I believe. Uh, oh yeah, runtime, change runtime type. I think that's good, right? Yeah, it looks good. Hardware accelerator. If it says like anything GPU, that's fine. And it does by default. And then you run this first one, then you just keep running them. And what you're eventually gonna do is, well, let me just show the image. You have this dog. Remember this dog? For those of you who went to the first meeting, basically a stupid ass dog. Uh, you can control his joints. He's only his joints. He doesn't know how to walk. So if you just like leave him as he is, He's just gonna collapse, fall down. Uh, this is why I call him stupid because he really is stupid. But uh, he's gonna collapse and fall down and he's not gonna do anything. Not even a ragdoll, he's just gonna fall down like this. He doesn't, like there's physics and everything, but like he doesn't know how to move his joints. He doesn't know how to do this, that doesn't do that. But what he's gonna be motivated by is a reward. And this reward, I guess, it's not so simple as just, oh, I do this, I'm reinforced for it. These rewards are long-term rewards because think about it like this. If you had, think about the types of situations that you'd be using reinforcement learning in. If you're playing a game, playing Mario, you're not getting rewarded for specifically optimal behavior. You're getting rewarded for like stomping on Goombas and uh, getting to the flagpole. That doesn't directly correlate to optimal play but it is just a symptom of that. And that is the key problem behind RL is that the rewards aren't really correlated to the actions that you take. As a result, you have really stupid dogs like this uh, that don't know how to go fetch a stick. But with the parameterization with the mathematical things that is preset in this notebook, uh, it is maybe, maybe a little bit less stupid than what you would initially train. But, Yeah, here's the joints. But are you all able to access the uh, the collab, this notebook? I can we send it in the Discord too? Yeah. <laughs> I'll send it out. I'd like everyone to 
just get a general feel for this. But yeah, the problem is we call it either credit assignment problem, like work, like if I, like we all played Smash Bros. Assuming you guys have or heard of it, oops. Uh, it's in the projects channel on Discord. So let's say you could do any move and like kill someone. And that's like your reward right there that you kill someone. But the agent, what it did is that like, let's say the best move to do there was maybe some move that was while you're on the ground. But maybe what the agent did is that it jumped, double jumped, went back to the ground and did a move that killed the other player or whatever. What do you think is going to happen? And now, every time it sees a player at like a killing, like a state where it could kill it, it's probably going to jump, double jump, uh, and then try to kill the player. And by then, that might not be a viable option. So... That's the problem behind the main problem I would say behind reinforcement money is that the rewards are sparse, also called the sparse rewards problem. But I like to call it the credit assignment problem. It's like, where the hell do we assign this credit of the reward? And there are there are certain ways to mitigate that. For example, this what we'll be doing here with this dog is use a different architecture in a way. So usually what happens is that back to that Markov decision process, but, or just how reinforcement learning is. The agent, give it a state, it'll, like it'll spit out uh, an action that it should do at that moment. And uh, usually that is in the form of what, they call it a policy, but what that really is is just a function that just state to action. And that is often implemented using a neural network. And, this dog does not use the typical neural network setup that you will often see in like diagrams of reinforcement learning. Uh, what is usually used is like called a deep Q network. You don't really need to know that term to be honest, uh, but it uses, I think this is really cool. And by the way, you're not expected to like memorize any of this. I'm just blabbing on, but like, I think this is just really cool for like uh, at a high level. What the dog will be doing is that it has two agents, technically the actor and the critic. It uses an actor critic architecture. It is probably one of the most uh, technically the default architecture uh, at this point, most often used for reinforcement learning on because of how just stable it is. And fun fact, the one that it uses is called PPO, Proximal Policy Optimization. And that is what ChatGPT uses, by the way, to like the thing, there were two things that revolutionized ChatGPT. The uh, stuff with the text, we like to call those transformers. That's the actual official term. If you're here for John's meeting, he also mentioned that. Uh, and then the other thing uh, was called RLHF, Reinforcement Learning with Human Feedback, which means like, uh, like GPT, what it does is that it just completes a sentence. That is not always the case for, uh, like if you were saying, make me a recipe, what's it gonna complete? Like it's, it'll tell you about a recipe, but like, like yeah. So reinforcement learning with human feedback is essentially saying, okay, let's let's rank it such that like, if it's saying make me a recipe, like it knows it's a command or something, uh, it brings those responses and it uses PPO for that, which is an actor credit card. But back to actor credit. The actor is the one that does the, is, the actor is a stupid one. It does, it does the action. And then the critic says, you're stupid, uh, get good. And it will, it will do that. And the actor essentially, it starts to try to please the critic. So essentially why you're calling it actor, actor critic. Like, uh, I guess, to be more precise, what these architectures like to do is that they try to predict the expected, they try to learn the expected long-term reward, like uh, getting to a flagpole in Mario. Uh, and they call it like a, call that state action value function for actor when they're like judging the value of an action. They're trying to say like, okay, in this situation, what is the value of this action? And their decision is just basically their 
their expected value. They don't know the actual reward of taking that action in that situation. Now the critic, it says, okay, how valuable is this state? So is the state of whatever it is right now. And what makes that so good is that the actor starts, as both of them learn, the actor starts to choose actions whose state is more highly valued than the critic. So the actor is essentially just simping for the critic. Uh, no, that's literally what happens. So, uh, and why this is so important is that like, remember credit assignment problem, these, these agents or actions aren't really purely tied to rewards. You can take an action, but the flagpole is not an action itself. You take actions and then the result is getting to the flagpole. Now, at the flagpole, that is a state in itself. The state is really what leads to reward because it's not going to detect that, oh, you reached the flagpole until Mario is like literally right there until the, I guess, bounding box or whatever it reaches there. And that state itself is valuable and it is now able to link actions to value. So it's not being a stupid little dog who's uh, running around chasing nothing. I mean, it still does that even with this, but... Uh, Maybe a little bit less so. Now, I guess to walk through this, I'm going to start going a little bit faster. Uh, oh yeah, this is the, these are the parameters to the actor, quote unquote, or Oh, dude. did I forget to run one? Oh my God. All right. <laughs> oh. oh yeah, you can see this uh, dot ONNX. You caught that. That's another like little link. Uh, yeah, who cares? Uh, it's, oh, okay. I had to, I have to log in. Okay. Yeah. The other thing is that you need to create, go to huggingface.co. Oh, this, this website. And you want to create an account uh, in John's workshop. Uh, he directed to that. And I'm sure that everyone here who went to that probably already has accounts. And what you're going to do is you're going to go to your, you want to go to your uh, token and copy and paste that. And the reason you're going to want to do that is so that you can actually like upload your model. And you're going to actually get to see the dog run around that you may. Now, this is actually a notebook from Huggy Face. Uh, Wait, is this the right? Is this the right one? Files. That's the one that we should have. Oh, this does use ML agents, by the way. I didn't see this, but it does. So I guess it would be nice. Yeah, I can't. You probably shouldn't share your token, which is why I'm not really like putting it in. Uh, cause it's like tr sharing your streaming key. Yeah. Just, just log in on there. Yeah. All right.
switch to your screen. Uh, switch to my screen. Jason. Yeah. Uh, the laptop button. Huh? Oh, we not yet. Yeah, not yet though. Also, Jason, is the audio for the Zoom? Um, Now, if any of you have been going through this notebook, oh yeah, make sure to let us know if you have any questions. For the people who've been going through this notebook, uh, you might have seen stuff like, like in that weird YAML thing, uh, like behaviors, trainer type, it says PPO. Yeah, that is proximal policy optimization. And you might see some stuff like uh, some weird Greek, like literally Lambda, Epsilon, Beta. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, but those are essentially parameters used in the math of the, they're like variables in the math that are used to uh, make the actor. Now. Can you just oh yeah, I need to. Uh, and also, I don't think you're supposed to run the one where it just has me, yeah, well, it's just, uh, or maybe you are. I'll run it and it says invalid syntax because it's not Python, mm. uh, which is to be expected. Oh, yeah, you can't just blindly run all these, you have to. You have to actually copy and paste this into a collab file because it's like designed to help you learn to navigate collab. Okay, can you do my share screen? Yeah, I can actually do it here. So okay. I'm talking about this. Uh, of course, it's going to run an error because it's like this is not Python. This is actually YAML. So you want, and the instructions say, okay, you're not supposed to run this. You're just supposed to copy and paste this to a uh, file using collab. So it says, uh, we need to create a config file. Uh, so we click the folder and then we go to uh, ML agents uh, slash config slash PPO because we're using PPO. And then we create a new file called huggy.yaml. And yeah, that's the name of the dog, huggy. Uh, and then we just open it up. Okay. Okay, yeah, it's open up on the right here. Let me just, this code over here, I wanna copy and we paste it. Then we hit control S to save. And then afterwards, we want to train our agent and should run. And it's gonna take a while. Probably like, oh, look at that, it said Unity. But this is probably gonna take like 20 minutes. Or so, so I just recommend, the reason I kind of started this up a little bit early is because I wanted you guys to just leave a training so that uh, while it trains, we get into some cool stuff. Now actually, it's actually, There are two main types of methods in reinforcement learning. Uh, this is just like jibber jabber right now. Uh, I'm, you're not expected to know this, but essentially policy based value methods. Policy based is just like it uses weird terminology where your agent, like exactly how I said before, like something 
uh, it's just predicting the next action uh, straight up. Like from a state, this predicts the next action. Value is like, like technically it does the same thing, but like uh, it's less resource intensive where like it's not straight up predicting the less, the next action or it could be a little bit more, but like you take a state and then the action and it predicts the value of the action and just like chooses the highest one, highest valued action of that state. And then actor critic is actually in between these two where it takes the best of both worlds where the critic is the policy, the actor is the value. Hence why you see that uh, one of them is definitely uh, smarter than the other. Or policy harder to train, value easier to train, better for demoing and stuff, but actor critic is a nice middle ground and why it's uh, one of the reasons why it's so widely used. Uh, now, does anyone have any issues with a notebook right now? Because it, it does explain things very well, in my opinion. As we let it run, we're just going to go back to the slides. We still got quite a bit. Now, I guess a bit of a, more of a recap. So you guys are coming for a level two project. I mean, level one. Level one project, problem part two. And Unity ML Agents is the learning environment we're going to be using. In fact, the notebook that I just showed you is actually using ML Agents. And are you able to see the mouse? Okay, so. In ML agents, what we're going to be doing in our uh, Pong part two for adding the agents, we're going to start in this environment of the Unity, this gray you could think of as the Unity, and uh, the little Python is going to like like go and bite one of the Pong paddles out of the uh, out of the bag and insert some RL bin in it, and that's this is where the, you can think of this as the venom, the trainer, and this red is the Python itself, and what you just did with the notebook, you were the snake. You took the dog and you're inserting its venom. You're inserting the RL venom into it as we speak, as it's training. It's going to take like 20 minutes. But yeah, and put it back in, put it back into that unity because that dog was, that environment was made in unity. Uh, going to export it to what it's basically going to do, not this one specifically, but uh, the process going forward will be you take that model that now you have it in Python, put it into like export it as an .onx file, and there's a there's a function for that, and then you put it through Centus, and there you go. Now, that's next steps for part two. Uh, does everyone have what's the how are we feeling with the progress for part one? I also want to meet people where they're at. So if you think that you already have like a good enough background and stuff like that, I'm not going to stop you uh, from just jumping straight into part two. I think part one is very useful for people who uh, are either, were either at ground zero or just not as confident uh, with their ability to work in large projects. And well, the other thing is I often see people overestimating their abilities. So be a little bit careful with that. Uh, try to find an example of when you've been able to prove these skills. And if you are, even if it's like a small one, I think you'll be fine. But one thing we wanted to do is set up uh, sprints, if, you, if you've heard of them. They're actually from uh, a certain agile methodology called Scrum. Uh, and I'm not gonna really get into the details of that, but basically it's just like, you're given, you're given a task, uh, throughout the like for like two weeks or something, you're given a few tasks, you just gotta complete them. And afterwards, you have a meeting with a few people, discuss maybe what you learned about the project, uh, update your uh, update in your head or in everyone's heads, what finished will look like, what what needs to be done next, and all that stuff. And it's just that iterative process. That's what. That's basically what Scrum is. And that's one of the things that we will be using for our level two projects. And it is actually the industry, the most common industry standard that is used everywhere. And 
I think I'm going to send out, send out a poll on what kind of tool that you guys would like uh, that is free. We were going to use Jira, but which is the industry standard, but it is, uh, well, invite more than 10 people and it, it's not free anymore. So we could have something like literally an ocean if that was what people wanted. It could even be maybe even Slack. That, that could work, but we'll have a few options and we'll just send it to you guys so you guys can have a poll on that. And regardless of everything else, uh, make sure to check the Discord. And since I haven't really seen many pull requests from the part one repository, I'm gonna give everyone until Sunday and we will leave everything up. So don't worry. Uh, don't feel like you need to catch up if it's like, cause you're not gonna be left behind because uh, everything is gonna stay up there. So you can do things at your own pace, but uh, we're gonna pivot a little bit more uh, once the end of Sunday comes. So like the end of, I guess this next general meeting comes so that we can, I'll actually just straight up start sending uh, everyone the the next step they need to take. Uh, and it was originally planned to just be a sprint, but yeah, uh, it might still be a sprint. It, if it is, it's just, it's probably gonna either be through like Discord or like a notion or something. I'll make sure to keep everyone updated on that.